who is Mary Poppins? I'm Mary Poppins, y'all! When I decided to do Mary Poppins Month, I had no real knowledge besides what I knew from Disney. And even that, last time I had watched that was like 23 years ago, so even then I didn't really know a lot. All I knew was that she was a magical nanny, and that Saving Mr. Banks was a good film. So I decided, what the heck, let's try to find out. And I do wish that this video could be on the books completely, but I am going to have to discuss the movie from time to time, as it is hard to separate common pop culture knowledge from any discussion on the stories. I'll try to keep it brief, but it will come up. There are six books in the main Mary Poppins canon. Mary Poppins, which was published in 1934. Mary Poppins Comes Back, published in 1935. Mary Poppins Opens the Door in 1943. Mary Poppins in the Park in 1952. Mary Poppins in Cherry Tree Lane in 1982. And Mary Poppins in the House Next Door in 1988. There are two additional books, Mary Poppins A to Z, which is an alphabet book based on Mary Poppins, and then Mary Poppins in the Kitchen, a cookery book with a story. The art for all of these were done by Mary Shepard, who does an amazing job with all the art. However, I do have to say that I'm not a big fan of the children's model, but I think that might just be the part of me that is put off by Cherubin and the Campbell's kids. Seriously though, she does a great job with this art. P.L. Travers did originally want to get the illustrator from Winnie the Pooh, but when he was unavailable, she instead got Mary Shepard. A fun fact, Mary Shepard's father, E.H. Shepard, is the illustrator from Winnie the Pooh. The story begins in a small dilapidated house, number 17, Cherry Tree Lane. Living here is the Banks family, parents George and Winifred, and the children, Jane, Michael, and the infant twins, John and Barbara. And although the Banks family is established as not having enough money f to both have a nice house and all these kids, they do have quite a number of people in their employ. Their cook is Mrs. Brill, maid named Ellen, and kind of a jack-of-all-trade named Robertson A., who suffers from narcolepsy and falls asleep in the most inconvenient places multiple times throughout the books. As the book opens, the former nanny, Katie Nana, has left unexpectedly, leaving the Banks family without anyone to watch after the kids. After Mrs. Banks puts out an ad for a new nanny, our titular character comes out of the sky, coming from the east, and descending with her umbrella. Mary Poppins is described as a young woman with piercing blue eyes, an upturned nose, she smells of toast, That that that's stated several times throughout the books, actually. Yeah. She always yeah. smells of toast. Do you remember? Her crisp apron yeah. is very crackly. And she has a Cockney accent. When dismissing things that people will say to her, she lets out a dismissive sniff. For example, if Michael apologizes, saying, Mary Poppins, I didn't mean it, she will answer with a frown, a turn of the head, and a sniff. So, Mary Poppins, I didn't mean it. <laughs> Just that. The craziest thing about Mary Poppins, however, is her family. In addition to the wacky human relatives that she has, she is also related to a snake in the zoo, the terrapin, uh, one of the eldest creatures living, and one of her uncles is the man in the moon. The kids go on many magical adventures with her until she leaves when the winds change. She comes back when the children are flying a kite and is reeled in with the aforementioned kite. She and the kids go on adventures until she leaves suddenly on a carousel. Then she comes back from a cinder from a firework and they go on lots of adventures until she leaves for good this time in the reflection of a door. That is a pretty crude summary of the first three books. The last three books all take place before her final departure. And the first three books all have a lot of similarities to them. For example, obviously Mary Poppins arrives. They visit one of Mary Poppins' relatives who are having an unlucky day. In the first book, Mary's uncle, Mr. Wig, becomes airborne whenever he laughs on his birthdays when they fall on the second Friday of a month. In the second book, it's her cousin, Arthur Turvey, who does the opposite of whatever his intentions are on the second Monday of every month. Her cousin, Fred Twigley, who we find in the third book, gets seven wishes. And, and pardon me, I'm going to look away because I have to look at my script while I'm reading this. Cousin Fred Twigley, who gets seven wishes on the first new moon, after the second wet Sunday, after the third of May. At, at a certain point, the books knew how absurd this got. Which, you know, I kind of like that. G good job, PL. And the wishes are an unfortunate thing, as 
Some woman is trying to force him to marry her so that she gets the wishes. In the first three books, Mary Poppins also tells one story each, all involving a king somehow. In the first one, it's about how her mother knew a dancing cow who went to a king to, for advice. In the second book, she tells the story of the king who meets the dirty rascal, who we actually find out is Robertson A. And in the third book, she tells the story of the cat who looked at the king. The cat outwits the king and gets their kingdom. Cats are apparently very smart in this. Fourth similarity. The kids attend some kind of fantastic celebration that humans normally don't get to attend. For example, in the first book, whenever Mary Poppins' birthday falls on a full moon, which we actually find out later that her birthday is November 1st, very fitting that I made November Mary Poppins month, although that was just a coincidence. But anyways, um, whenever Mary Poppins' birthday falls on a full moon, the animals in the zoo are given the ability to speak. And the kids watch them put on shows with humans in cages. In the second book, the kids get to watch the constellations do a dance recital. And in the third book, the kids are brought underwater to a society of fish who catch humans on a hook. And every single one of these stories, uh, the kids do not start off with Mary Poppins. They come as special guests and they don't know what they're special guests for, who they're special guests of, anything like that. But it eventually turns out it's Mary Poppins. And of course, the last similarity is that Mary Poppins leaves. Now, for the last three books, we are given adequate information to form a timeline. If Mary Poppins in the Park is in proper order, then the last half of Mary Poppins in the Parks takes place after the beginning of Mary Poppins Opens the Door, as Annabelle is teething in the beginning of Opens the Door, and she is teething in the fourth chapter of Mary Poppins in the Park. And the first three chapters have to all take place after the middle of the second book, as Annabelle Banks, a child that came out of nowhere, was born. Seriously, like nobody, it seems like nobody knew that Mrs. Banks was pregnant. Not even Mr. Banks. Just all of a sudden, boop, new baby. So Mary Poppins in the Park definitely takes place after the second half of book two, Mary Poppins Comes Back, and the la later half takes place after the start of Mary Poppins Opens the Door. Mary Poppins in Cherry Tree Lane, which is actually just one story about 50 pages, takes place during Chapter 3 of Mary Poppins in the Park, as Michael Banks has been giving a pirate hat from Admiral Boom, but he soon thereafter loses it. We end the chapter with the park keeper picking up the hat, and in Mary Poppins in Cherry Tree Lane, he has the pirate hat at the beginning, having recently discovered it. Mary Poppins in the house next door is a little harder to place, although it seems like it's near the end of Mary Poppins Opens the Door, as Miss Andrew, Mr. Banks' governess, known as the Holy Terror, is in the South Seas at the end of Mary Poppins Opens the Door, but in Mary Poppins and the House Next Door, she is back from the South Seas. Now, I honestly thought this was going to be the easiest video to make in Mary Poppins Month, because it's like, oh, it's just basically a book report. How hard is that? Well, it's not hard if your books have a plot. Unfortunately, the Mary Poppins books do not have much of a plot to speak of. It's just a collection of adventures that the kids and Mary Poppins go on, or it's stories that Mary Poppins tells the kids. And let's take this moment to segue on the relationship between Mary Poppins and the kids. The kids find Mary Poppins very fascinating, they love the adventures that they go on, and they find her quite fascinating. Mary Poppins, on the other hand, doesn't really share this opinion on the kids. When the kids talk about their adventures with Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins gaslights them, saying that the adventures never happened. And she gets a little angry that the kids would make such a suggestion, usually Michael. Of course, the kids always do find some kind of evidence that their adventure with Mary Poppins did in fact happen. I do have to say that I found Mary Poppins to be... Well, I found her to be a real a-hole while I was reading these books. In addition to being a chronic gaslighter, often making the kids question their own sanity, she is also a narcissist. And I don't just mean that she's full of herself, I mean she is very similar to Narcissus. Because whenever Mary Poppins passes a reflective surface, she has to stare at herself for a moment. Although she is full of herself as well. She is a gaslighting narcissist, and it is made clear that both Michael and Mrs. Banks are intimidated by her. In fact, this illustration from Mary Poppins in the Park kind of, kind of sums up the, what's wrong with the whole dynamic. And although we do see it in this picture, Mary Poppins does not smile too often. The few times she does, it's a quick smirk, it's a result of her narcissism, or it's whenever she is around Bert. 
who in this is actually quite a minor character, and instead of being a chimney sweep, he is a matchstick man. He does make the chalk paintings, and although not a one-man band, it is established that he plays the hurdy-gurdy. Um, for those that don't know what a hurdy-gurdy is, it's this. <laughs> I guess since I'm on the topic of Bert, let's talk about characters. The primary cast of the book is the Banks family, their subservience, and after them, it's the people that are living in Cherry Tree Lane, or whose business takes them around Cherry Tree Lane. One of their neighbors, Mr. Boom, is a retired admiral who seems to have a tick to work in sea shanties into normal conversation. He lives with his wife, a deckhand who is a former pirate, and his dachshund. The only other neighbor who has much prominence in this book is Miss Lark. Miss, Miss Lark is a rich woman living in a wealthy estate next to the Banks family, and Miss Lark pampers her dog Andrew, much to his annoyance. The park keeper from the park across the street from the neighborhood isn't a fan of Mary Poppins and is often annoyed by her, although he is kind of a grump at all times, often yelling at people to obey the bylaws and not to litter. And finally is the policeman, whose beat takes him through Cherry Tree Lane, and he becomes quite infatuated with Banks family's maid, Ellen. One thing that's quite off-putting about this book series, however, is the casual racism. As there are plenty of stereotypes in the adventures of Mary Poppins and the kids. In the chapter Bad Tuesday of the first book, Mary Poppins takes the kids on an adventure to the four corners of the earth after Mary Poppins finds a compass. North, they meet an Eskimo family. West, a Native American grandfather and grandson. South, an African family. And East, someone referred to as the Mandarin. And the depictions of the African group are the most uncomfortable. The way that the mother's speech is written, she sounds like Miss Cleo. And there's talk of watermelon. And in addition to those two points, they also use the other N-word. But after they're done with their adventures, Michael takes the compass and decides to go to the Four Corners by himself. This time, however, all the people that they met earlier have become hostile towards them and are going to attack them but Mary Poppins comes in and saves the day. Now, all modern versions of this book seem to have a modified chapter here. Instead of meeting people at the four points, they instead meet animals. And although I generally dislike when I get censored books, here, it didn't actually bug me. The reason for that are probably because P.L. Travers herself actually was the one to make the changes. She decided to make the changes in the 1970s after it had been brought to her attention that the books might be a little insensitive. She personally disagreed with it, but she changed it anyway. Unfortunately, uncomfortable depictions in the later books were not changed. When the kids are acting up, she compares them to the Zulu, and when visiting the miniature park that Jane made while in the park, Parkception, one of the inhabitants of the mini park is taken away by an, by an Indian looking for a... Now, I have stated that I find Mary Poppins to be quite a reprehensible character, and that's not going to change. However, she does have some redeeming qualities. Despite being an arc, she does rescue the kids whenever they're in need. For example, in Mary Poppins Comes Back, Jane is teleported into a scene depicted on a bull, and when the inhabitants of the bull try to keep her in the bull... That, that's, that's a weird statement. Mary Poppins comes and rescues her from being kept there. So despite being infatuated with herself, she will save the kids, although that kind of seems like bare minimum to me. What I find most redeeming about Mary Poppins, though, is her relationship with animals. In the first book's chapter, Miss Lark's Andrew, Miss Lark's dog Andrew, runs away and when he comes back, he brings back a mutt named Willoughby, refusing to stay if Miss Lark does not allow Willoughby to stay. The whole time Mary Poppins acts as mediator between Miss Lark and the dogs. And then in Mary Poppins Comes Back, in the chapter Miss Andrew's Lark, Mary Poppins sets free a lark that Miss Andrews has found and captured, and when Miss Andrew throws a stink about it, Mary Poppins causes uh, Miss Andrew to become stuck in the cage and be carried away. So she does seem to like animals, so good, cool. Also, there's the whole she's friends with the zoo animals thing, so that's cool too. She is a bit antagonistic towards a starling that enters the nursery, although this is probably because the starling is kind of a jerk to the kids. The babies are able to understand the lark, as is Mary Poppins. The bird's a jerk to the kids. She also has a bit of a problem with the bird lady's birds, but that's probably because one of them steals a flower out of her hat. Oh, uh, by the way, the bird lady, um, she is the mother of the park keeper, and the whole bank run plot of the movie, th that's not present here. In fact, the kids, it seems like, has 
fed the birds many times. And actually, it was kind of like a, hey, you got to buy the bird feed last time. I want to buy it this time. In the first book, she only says feed the birds tuppence a bag. Later books, she a little more is added to her vocabulary, but that is still usually there. Now, again, I must ask, who is Mary Poppins? Is she a witch? I don't believe so, as we never see her with a wand or anything. We don't see her use any familiars. Is she a djinn? Well, this is during some colonial times for the British Empire, so it is possible, you know, that she came from one of the territories that they owned at the time, but I don't know, it just doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem correct to me. The two best guesses that I have are that she is either a mythological creature or that she is a constellation. Perhaps both, as, you know, there's, you know, mythic creatures in the constellations, like Orion, let's say. Now, I say she might be a mythical creature as she knows Poseidon, she knows many fairy tale creatures. She knows many fairy tale characters. And she was the nanny for some princes from a fairy tale book. Now, I think she might be a constellation, as she is quite familiar with the constellations, and they have quite the reverence for her. Oh, the constellations are actually characters in the books. Like, there's a few times they actually come down to Earth, and it, like, just like humans. They're humans, but. When they're on the earth, the constellations aren't in the sky. The only problem I see with this is that when she dances with the sun and the sun kisses her cheek, she is left with a bit of a red mark from the sun. So if she was a constellation herself, it seems like maybe a star shouldn't be able to affect her. But P.L. Travers actually did kind of tease that this might be a possibility. Pleiades were the... Uh... Uh, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, thought that they were seven sisters in the sky. And uh, that's why I wrote the story. And maybe Mary Poppins does belong in that world. Who am I to say? But it's a very good guess. However, she never did indulge what Mary Poppins was. She, she kept that secret. Now, this video's been kind of all over the place. Again, it, there's no structure here, so it's kind of hard to talk in a structural way. But I guess... Now that I'm thinking about it, there is one important question that I should ask. Since, you know, B saving Mr. Banks did kind of imply that this is a thing. Did Mary Poppins save Mr. Banks instead of the kids? I don't think so. He's very grumpy at the beginning of the book series, and by the end he does seem happier. But I don't think that he really seems saved. Again, he's happier, he's a better character. But he was never in any kind of danger. All in all, I gotta say, I wasn't a huge fan of the books. There were some of them were real hard to get through, like especially the stuff with the constellations. I don't know what it was, but those ones just kind of dragged for me. Some chapters went by fast, however. I there were some that I found enjoyable, some I did not. I do have something I need to ask though. If it wasn't for the movie, would the books still be remembered today? Honestly, I don't know. I mean, one of the reasons she acquiesced to Disney was because her books weren't selling, so that is something that would support that hypothesis, but... I mean, it had already been translated into several different languages at the time, and by the time the movie came, came out, there was the four main books and Mary Poppins A to Z. In fact, Mary Poppins in the Kitchen would come, back, come out like ten years later. So they were successful, but I, I legitimately do not know if they would have stood the test of time. And it's kind of cruel, almost, but if it wasn't for Disney, Mary Poppins might not be known today. I mean, of course, to some extent, people would know who she is. I mean, in the same way that there are people who know that Aunt Phyllis's Cabin is a book. I, I want to get to that book eventually someday. Um... Next time I do, like, some kind of book month, maybe I'm going to do Uncle Tom's Cabin. Maybe I'm not going to commit myself to anything. But that, I think that would be cool. Um, I lost my train of thought there. But yeah, I, I personally don't believe they would be as well remembered as they are after the movie had been successful. So next week, let's watch the movie. Uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Take care. Remember that you are valid. Bye-bye.
In Mary Poppins in the Park, Michael is transported to the cat planet and he is forced to stay there forever, being a slave to the cats. However, he is able to outsmart the cats in a series of riddles. Michael Banks is a Ravenclaw.